This is Dr. David Pomeroy, your host on ADHD Focus. I wanted to remind you that the show is not intended to be a recommendation for diagnosis or treatment of any condition for any specific person. Please consult your mental health professional or doctor managing your ADHD or mental health issues about any diagnosis or treatment related information that you hear on the show. Refer your ADHD provider to the show if he or she would like more information. Thank you. Hello, this is Dr. David Pomeroy, your host on ADHD Focus. And today we have a particularly important topic to discuss, and that is cannabis and ADHD. There are more and more states that are legalizing uh, cannabis for either medical use or general recreational use, and it has a particular specific effect on the ADHD brain and developing brain, so it's important that we talk about it. My guest today is Roberto Olivardia. He is a psychologist who has a private practice in the Boston area and also is an instructor at Harvard Medical School. Roberto, welcome. Thank you for having me, David. Let's just dive right into looking at what's the the scope of the issue in terms of how many, what percentage, as best we can tell, of teenagers, young adults um, are using cannabis. Yeah, so what we know is, and why this is an important topic is, um, aside from the fact that we know that there are states, uh, I live in Massachusetts, where it's, it's legal, um, we, this is a substance that, you know, not only is the, the messaging and the marketing behind it being this is not harmful, but even it takes it a step further by saying it's actually helpful, it's medicinal. Um, and a lot of people is, are buying into that marketing. And the National Institute of Drug Abuse in 2018 have have collected a lot of data and they find that there are a lot of young people that are using all the different forms of cannabis, whether you're smoking it, uh, dabbing, edibles. Um, 1.3% of eighth graders are using it on a daily basis, about 4.8% of 10th graders. That's, that's, that's what the National Institute of Drug Abuse, 4.8% of 10th graders are using daily and 6.4% of 12th graders are using daily. Now, when they actually look at past year of marijuana use, they find that 11.8% of 8th graders have used marijuana in the past year, 28.8% of 10th graders, and almost 36% of 12th graders have used it in the past year. It is much more common than people think and much more accessible. Yes, Kind of like uh, alcohol used to be, yes, you can't have it until you're 21, and that's a laugh because everybody knows. Exactly. Someone who can get it. And when they look, and exactly. And the studies show that with college students in 2018, um, studies have shown that up to 43% of college students have used marijuana at least once in the past year. 25% of college students reported using um, at least, you know, once in the prior 30 days. Um, and, you know, even with vaping, for example, that uh, one study showed that the vaping of marijuana doubled for college students in one year alone, between 2017 and 2018. Um, and the 30-day prevalence of vaping marijuana increased in college students in another study from 5.2% of college students to 10.9% in one year. So vaping in particularly, where it is so accessible, where people you know, think that there's nothing wrong with it. And um, so this, this is something that really warrants us to look at a further examination yeah. when you hear that one, 1.3% of eighth graders are using it yeah, daily. That just blows me away. And vaping, I know that the concentration of THC can be and often is much higher than what you'd get just uh, using a bong to smoke the, the flower. Um, or even uh, edibles. And I think there's there's probably a crossover between, oh, I'm vaping nicotine, that's healthier than smoking cigarettes, so there's no problem in vaping some weed. And 
it that, spins that's exactly right. That's right. And even more so, I mean, just as far as THC, I mean, one of the things that is really important to impress upon people is, you know, I, I grew up in the 80s and, you know, Nancy Reagan was telling us just say no. We had the commercials of the eggs in the frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, the dangers of marijuana being a gateway drug. And unfortunately, you know, I mean, those messages never really landed and they were sort of seen as like the butt of jokes and, and such. Um, and the truth of the matter was that it wasn't as dangerous then as it is yes. now. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not saying it was a good thing then, but just to understand the weed today is not someone's father or grandfather's weed, um, that no. even in the early 1990s, the average THC content in the early 90s was about 3.8%. In 2014, the average THC content in cannabis is 12.2%. So it's hmm. quadruple the amount. Now that's just in, that's, you know, considered like lightweight. I mean, I have patients yeah. who consume edibles that have 50 to 60 percent THC. Um, if you, you know, there are fairs are across the country, you know, marijuana cannabis fairs in which there are mm-hmm. contests of waxing and, and dabbing to try to create the highest level THC. And some people can get up to 80 to 90 percent. And what's important about that is understanding that's we should really be thinking of this as a different substance to the brain because yes. it really is the equivalent of being, let's say, hit in the head, you know, with um, uh, a small rock and being hit in the head with a really big rock, you know, in terms uh-huh. of the neurological impact of that. Yeah, and I grew up more in the 60s, graduated from college in 71, so that was right in the you know, the birth of hippiedom and... Uh, Mm-hmm. I don't know it was quite 50 percent, but probably close to that in uh, college. And yeah, I have a joint, and you just get silly. Um, right. I certainly didn't get the effects that people are talking about now with a really high percentage. So what exactly Absolutely. does cannabis do in the, in the brain? What areas does it affect? So one of the the most important um, takeaways is that, you know, unlike some substances which people can sort of point to these behaviors that are are maladaptive or that are bad or um, unhealthy, what we call positive symptoms, and I don't mean that like great, um, but more positive meaning the presence, (laughs) the presence of something that is problematic. Um, With cannabis, what's insidious about it is that it's more what's not happening that is the bigger problem, what we call the negative symptoms, so the absence of things or the slowing down of things. And And just to keep in mind, what I'm talking about is the research that really is looking at people who are using um, prior to the age of 25. And for people with ADHD, to know that a, an ADHD brain takes a little bit longer to fully develop, so we're talking maybe before the age of 27, so a developing mm-hmm. brain, that it really alters parts of the brain that are responsible for motivation, for memory, for attention, for processing speed. Uh, studies show that one's ability to learn is uh, a slower process um, when they're using cannabis, and not just when they're on cannabis, but even people who are regular users during days when they're not using, um, they find that those effects, you know, can last and can sometimes, when people are using at a very young age, very high THC, it could be irreversible. Um, Mm. Performing complicated tasks, Um, It could affect your time perception, your affect. It reduces your impulse control. And what's what's important, too, is, you know, when when there are studies that are looking at with rats, for example, who are giving cannabis, that, you know, in our brains, we have neurons or nerve cells, and we want those nerve cells to have as many dendrites, which are, um, Mm -hmm. you know, basically like little branches that sprout off the neuron. And, you know, just like if, Right. That if you and I were driving, if we were going, driving from, you know, Boston, where I am to Washington State, where you are, 
Um, if there was just one road to get there and that road was clogged up or traffic jammed, that would be really frustrating and it would delay the trip. I want to have multiple roads. Like I, we mm-hmm. want to have multiple dendrites and so that we have multiple ways of getting our message through and have it be fluid. And what studies show in adolescent rats is that those that are exposed to THC, their neurons form less, significantly less dendrites. And that is not something that is always reversible. So for yeah. people to understand that they're, they're, they're basically messing with the architecture of their brain, the, 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 the foundation of their brain in such a way that could really um, impact them, you know, later in yeah. life. Um, there was a study in New Zealand, a 2012 study, that found that um, adolescents who had cannabis use disorder, that there was a significantly high correlation with the loss of of an average of up to eight IQ points measured in mid-adulthood. So adolescents who are heavy um, users of cannabis, Mm -hmm. when they did testing and then followed them up years later compared to people who were not using cannabis, those who use lost eight IQ points. Like it literally, it's almost like it made them less intelligent. Um, And that's that's frightening. Complex and and, uh, like you say, ways to get around a certain block and you look at an adolescent brain that's making a lot of connections and those kind of get cut back as some areas are used and others not so much. Well, if you've limited the amount that are that can grow or uh, become networks, then you cut some of those back. You're left with yeah you know, less less resources that you can bring to thing. And I would think that particularly when you put the problems with memory, attention, processing speed, then your problem solving capabilities are going to be much lower. You, you don't That's have absolutely that, true. That option and That's right. it may not come back. Right. And I think for adolescents it's important, you know, for them to keep in mind that you know, the executive demands of life increase, obviously, as we get older. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of adolescents I work with are like, this is not interfering or impacting with my life. I'm still able to do work and whatnot. And then what they're not seeing is the writing on the wall that, well, when you're 25, when you're 30, and you're having to juggle many more things and, and shift and balance and regulate, which already is problematic for people with ADHD. When you have to do that more, that's when you're really going to see the impact of it. Mm-hmm. Now, keep in mind, I, mean, I do work with adolescents who are already severely compromised because of their cannabis use, but a lot of them who are not in that zone where they really understand the full nature of it because they're saying, I don't see a problem. Um, right. And But what we know is that it's it's happening internally in their brain. They just don't know that the, the, the architecture yeah. is being built, basically. Yeah, if you aren't using it, you can't see that you're not able to use it. Um, and exactly. Sure, I would think you'd say, gee, all you have to do now is go to school, get your homework done. Yeah, you have to maybe do your laundry, and but be there at meals. You don't have to shop for the meal, plan the meal, and take care of cleaning your apartment or room and keeping your calendar in terms of your job, your social things. There's so many more demands on that executive function um, that if you can't put those things together as fast, you're going to fall behind. That's right. That's there right. Any... And, there are, also, and there are also health, physical effects, too, that people think, well, first of all, the biggest misconception is that you can't get addicted to it. And that's not mm. true. That actually studies show that about 9% of adults and 18% of adolescents satisfy the criteria for a cannabis use disorder or a dependence on it. And we're not just talking about a psychological addiction, which is what a lot of people think. It's like, oh, no, you can get psychologically addicted, but you're not physically. You are. With the levels of THC that we're seeing now, we absolutely now, 
if we were to say this in the 60s, I don't know how many people could be addicted with the THC levels then. I don't know. And I guarantee it was, if it was existent, it was much, much less. But yeah. what we do now, now is the science is showing us that. So that alone is important. But in terms of um, studies on the heart find that it actually can, even though we think of cannabis as chilling people out, that over time it actually makes the heart work harder. It dilates the blood vessels. It can raise resting heart rate. Um, one study found there was a risk of heart attack is several times higher in the hour after smoking. If you have a pre-existing cardiovascular yeah. problem, then smoking um, weed is puts you at major risk. For people who take methylphenidate for their ADHD, to know that methylphenidate and cannabis interact with each other in a way that could cause increased heart strain. Um, so there, are, and then from a psychological level, it can lead um, to issues with anxiety, with paranoia, with depression, but knowing especially that for most people with ADHD have a comorbid disorder like depression, anxiety, um, you know, binge eating. I mean, I work with a lot of people who have other issues and it always exacerbates those problems as well as exacerbating all of the ADHD issues. So although there's this gravitation that people with ADHD will say, well, I'm doing it because it helps my ADHD symptoms, we know from science, and I always preface to people out there when I'm talking about this, I don't come from this from a moral perspective at all. Right. Like, in fact, I'm a very strong ally for people in recovery. I have people in my life who are in recovery, and um, I don't moralize this. I don't think that bad people become addicted yeah, to drugs. Exactly. Like, I understand that there, we, there are certain people, I have a very addictive personality, like I get it. And so I want people to understand I'm not coming from this perspective of, you know, drugs are, I'm telling you drugs are bad because that's the thing to say. I'm going with the science and what the science is showing is it's very alarming. I mean, even when I started delving into the scientific yeah. literature, I was surprised by some of the, I was just like you were surprised by hearing how many eighth graders are using daily. I was surprised by hearing how it affects the dendrites, um, how mm -hmm. there can be a yeah, correlation for certain people. Major issue. Uh, yeah. In terms of it's affecting brain structure. Um, and like you say, that's something that can affect you lifelong, even though as a teen you don't see it, hey, I just use it to chill out. Um, and in terms of that anxiety, one of the things I had read was that it's a THC that mainly helps with anxiety, CBD, not quite so much. And mm -hmm. it also reduces and takes the place of the endocannabinoids, the essentially little bit of cannabis we have that kind of effect already in our brain, but it not only takes the place of them, it reduces the production. So then as the THC right. effect wears off, you don't have these natural buffers to depression or anxiety. So one feels more anxious, see, I need some more. And it gets into that cycle, kind of like with nicotine and cigarettes, that's a little bit more immediate. People say, I calm down when I have a cigarette. Yes, because you're in withdrawal, mini withdrawal from nicotine. Have some, you're more calm. Um, That's right. What about that cycle? I've seen um, adolescents, even down to 12. Um, well, I, I need a green card or a medical card for marijuana because when I smoke it, I just feel normal. And I'm thinking, you're 12 mm -hmm. years old. How do you even have any concept of what normal is? Um, exactly. And so that, that and belief that, oh, it's okay, um, and gee, it's, it's legal, therefore it must be okay. Well, alcohol has been legal, but drinking every day <laughs> isn't okay. Right, right. And at the same time, it's important to validate that it's understandable when we understand the ADHD brain and um, you know the understimulation of the ADHD brain, the fact that we're you know an ADD brain is more uninhibited. When people say it helps me focus, I'm less bored, it helps me sleep, it grounds me, it slows down my racing ADHD brain. 
I say I, I don't doubt that. I'm sure it does all of those things in the short term, in, in that moment. And I validate for people that I don't, you know, I don't think that they're crazy because they're, they find this substance appealing. It, it makes total sense, especially when we understand how the ADHD brain can really lend itself to seeking things that both stimulate it as well as ground it. And, and then to tell them, well, what was that? Just that it, it's something new, and I guess if you're a teenager, you aren't supposed to buy it, so there's the attraction of you're doing something kind of illegal and a little risky, and that's an attraction with ADD. You're going to get a little dopamine from that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, and the novelty, sensation-seeking, and at the same time, I tell them, well, just because it's doing those things, it does not mean it's medicinal. And that, that's the, what we have to understand as clinicians and for parents out there is there is major, major, millions and millions of dollars of marketing that is being online. Oh, yeah. There are billboards even oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And oh, that are pushing, yeah, pushing this message that, this is medicine, um, and it is not medicine. There's a big difference between self-medicating oneself in an unhealthy way and something that's truly medicinal. And that, I find, is probably the most important point I try to get across to people who are using is I don't doubt that they're having those short-term effects, but then I ask them, how is it working for you in the long term? Like, do you find that you can – you can't find things fun unless you're um, yep. using you weed, high. that you're using cannabis. and Right. Or do you find your anxiety is you're, – you're reporting to me that your anxiety is actually getting worse over time, yet you're using cannabis, which you're saying is helping you. It, it's not helping you. In that moment, you know, just like – I mean, you made the analogy to alcohol. If, if somebody said, oh, I drink – five glasses of wine every night to go to sleep and it helps me sleep. Well, I don't doubt that it might help yeah. some people so sleep, but that, and you that, wake up. Yeah. yeah. And, and not, and not to mention what that does to your health. No one would say, well, then do that. That's what you should be right. doing every Drinking night. Um, well, right. Exactly. The benefit quote unquote that uh, someone would see in using is that it takes care of those positive symptoms of ADD, what you can see, what I'm experiencing now. I don't feel good. I'm depressed. I'm anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, I can escape and kind of chill out um, and relax. But like you say, they don't, you don't see the negative effects over long term. And of course, with ADD, it's the immediate that makes the difference. Long term is, that could be next week. That's still long term. Um, but to mm -hmm. look at when you're 35, do you want to be able to function pretty well, have a job that you can hold on to, have relationships that work, um, or just be playing video games, and even those you're not going to be very good at when you're high all the time. That's right, or even, it, yeah, or even if... That's right. And, and also just saying, you know, let's say if you're not, you know, in your parents' basement playing video games and you're working a 40 hour a week, but you may not realize that you're, you could be limiting yourself in terms of the opportunities, in terms of the kinds of jobs and careers that you want, the, you know, the, the kind of life that you want. Um, because I, I also, you know, I work with young adults who are saying, well, I don't, I didn't think there was a problem because I was working 40 hours a week. I'm not in my parents' basement playing video games. I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. eating to oblivion. And, and then what they realized um, and what I'm thinking of one patient in particular who came in um, to treatment and he said, I, I realized that I was a pretty, I consider myself a bright person, he said. And I really, he asked me, he goes, is there research that shows that we can make you dumb? He goes, mm -hmm. because he has ADHD, and he said, I know this is not the ADHD. He goes, I feel like what I thought I could do when I was 30, I feel like I'm so far behind that. And it's not yeah. the ADD because he goes, I've worked through that, and I got – and I shared with him some of the research, and he 
is convinced. He's like, I'm convinced that that happened to me. He goes, because he started using when he was 14, used very heavily, very yeah. high THC edibles, um, which by the way, I mean, even going back to the marketing is if you see how some of these edibles are packaged, they're packaged as gummy bears, they're packaged yeah, as look, sort of imitation yeah. Skittles and M&Ms. Exactly. I mean, come on. Like, it's like with Joe Camel, what did we do with that? We had a very aggressive pushback to say, you can't market, you know, to, to young mm-hmm. people. And that's exactly what the marijuana industry, the cannabis industry is doing. Um, so, but he realized that he was limiting himself. So what can parents do? How can parents approach this? I can see, yes, it would be nice to have a way to counter some of the marketing. But in terms of an individual uh, knowing how teens don't believe their parents know anything, would right. a parent be and the teen be better served by saying, I want you to talk to someone who can just look at the science and not tell you you're weak or dumb or you're uh, a bad person because you're doing it, because it's not a matter of willpower, it, uh, particularly with ADD. How can a parent help? Right. Hmm. I think at first, I mean, I, when I talk to parents, I say, you know, when you have a child with ADHD, it's really important to start conversations as proactively as possible about things like impulse control and, and things like that. You know, I have a son, he's 15, he has ADHD as, as I do. And I remember when he was young, um, it wouldn't be conversations about drugs, but I would say, you know, when we, people with ADHD, when we like something, we like it a lot um and you know we would sort of chuckle about it and i i would use the analogy of like oreos like i i'm convinced first of all that there's some like addictive substance in the cream of oreos (laughs) but um Um, i said you know daddy loves his oreos and and i don't you know it's very hard for me to have a package in the house because i can just like rip through it i said now i might buy the little package of six because i don't want to say, oh, I can't have Oreos, like I want to enjoy Oreos, but I have to know, I know where my limit is. And I would start with conversations like that at very young age, like basically introducing the idea of regulation and not having shame that that's something Mm -hmm. that you have to regulate, you know, that there's no, uh, you know, there's no shame that, yes, there are lots of people that can have packages and packages of Oreos in their house and be fine with it. And that's fine. I mean, I, that's just, what it is. Um, So we want to disconnect from the shame that this is something that could be problematic. And then as he got older, you know, around middle school, we did start having conversation. I'm a big music fan. I love music. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so a lot of times with some of the music that I listen to, some of the artists are dead and have died of drug overdoses. And, you know, when we have seen great, you know, films and movies and, um, my kids will be like, oh, what's that actor doing now? And I'm like, oh, like I remember, you know, we talked about Chris Farley from Saturday Night Live. One of my favorite comedy movies is Tommy Boy. And and he died of a drug overdose, which was, yeah, you know, tragic. And they're like, gosh, John Belushi, right, all of these. And so then I would say, you know, you're, when you start school, you're going to start to know people that are going to be vaping and that, you know, are doing these substances. And they're not going to think there's a problem with it. But – I, I say, but number one, understand that there is problems, you know, with that, and I explained mm-hmm. it, but then yep. I said, number two, as someone with ADHD, what we know that is a, a reality is that the bridge between experimentation and dependence is a much shorter bridge for people with ADHD, That's a great that if you, get a re- yeah. if, you, if you get a reward from it, it's much more difficult to just say, oh, I'm not going to have any more of that. Right. The ADD brain being less sensitive to reward that is eating a relative higher hit of dopamine to get the same reward. And of course, some is good, more must be better. Um, and exactly. Dependence and I like this cycle. Um, but- exactly. And, and, and I said that that's really, you know, important and having those, you know, conversations. Now, the other thing too is to, not moralize it. So not, um, 
even if you're talking about other people and, and saying like, oh my gosh, I can't believe the neighbor's son next door, you know, I found yeah. out he's addicted to opiates, you know, oh my God, what a, I thought he was such a nice kid, you know, that we don't want to, we want to move away from this idea that bad people do drugs. Lots of really, really yep. good people, very compassionate people have engaged in and have problems with drugs and alcohol. Um, and so we want to move away from that because then let's say if your child is using, the last thing they're going to want to do is tell you because now yeah. not only are you judging, but you're judging their character. You think that they're yeah. bad people. Um, I've had parents that say, what did I do wrong? Like what did, and I'll say, you know, you have to understand your child is growing up in a culture where this is so accessible. Like it's not like when we were kids where you really had to go through, like it took a lot of work, you know, to oh, go yeah. through certain yeah. channels and, and people. Um, it, it is not that way anymore. Um, it is so easy. And so we want to move. And then if you find out your child is using, absolutely talk about the science. And then to, and if they have a hard time listening because it's mom and dad, you know, even if you set up a one-off appointment with an expert, a scientist who can talk about, right. like, what I find when I talk with the teenagers, I talk about the brain. Like, I don't even look mm -hmm. at it from, oh, you just shouldn't oh, do that. Yeah. Well, of course they know no, that we're yeah. going to say that. <laughs> well, this is, yeah, what's real. Unfortunately, uh, we're out of time, as usual, on something that's interesting, important, and, and also really complex. Um, but I think we've yes. hit a lot of the, the high points, and particularly as far as the development of the adolescent brain and the fact that, gee, I'm, I'm fine. It's not going to hurt now. Yeah, the hurt is later, uh, and that's right. uh, the delayed non-gratification, I guess, is an mm -hmm. issue. Well, my guest today has been Roberto Olivardia, who's a psychologist and helps a lot of people with cannabis use disorder, and cannabis is becoming more prevalent. A lot of kids use it, at least try it. With ADD, I think it's easier to keep doing it. Um, so thank you so much, Roberto, for uh, helping us understand this complex topic. Well, thank you for having me, David, and, and for doing this topic, because I'm, I'm very passionate in just getting the message and just getting knowledge out there. I mean, knowledge is, is power. There. Absolutely. So my listeners, um, I hope you've gotten some good information today and that uh, you'll get some more next time we meet. Take care, stay safe, wear your mask. Bye.